another one. <clears throat> uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, automated inputs of, um, of falsely parameter types and also sampling of uh, falsely parameter types. So I want to begin by you know, reminding people of what parameter types are in the first place and how we are um, um, how we are using them to assign falsely parameters to um, to molecules, right? Um, so that I think they're basically right now out there. There are two different concepts. One is called indirect chemical perception. This is the thing we've been doing for thirty or forty years, based on atom types, where we basically say, okay, so every atom is this has its own chemical environment, and the combination of all these chemical environments allow us to define atom types, uh, sorry, bond types, angle types, proton types, and so on. Um, then you can uh, do another thing that's called direct chemical perception. This is what I've been, I will be using today, and um, which is also a large part of open force field, is that we say, okay, we are skipping this intermediate step where we're defining atom types. Instead, we are directly defining the chemistry that is going into our bond types, angle types, and so on. <clears throat> and we are doing that by something that's called SMARTS. SMARTS is a um, a sort of one dimensional chemical notation language that allows us to encode substructure queries in a very intelligent and clever way. <clears throat> uh, and we can use that to directly define the chemistry we're interested in for a given one type and so on. So, so now let's, let's set the crown a bit for, for the experiments we want to do today or uh, in my talk, which is, I'm, we, we want, to, we want to start on the left side, which is we are totally ignorant about chemistry or we're not un, we're uninformed about chemistry, let's put it that way. And, and we say we have never seen a molecule in our life, but the only thing that we know is there must be something like bonds and angles and torsions. So we're saying, okay, so if there's just one bond type in this universe that we, that we know, one angle type and one torsion type. And then all of a sudden we see some data. And after we've seen that data, we can actually say, and only at that point, um, that there are actually different bond types, different bond chemistries, different angle chemistries, and torsion chemistries. And the whole idea is that we only want to discover the chemistry and the, and the types based on the data that we have. So nothing more, really just, just it just, just really fits on, into our chemical universe that we, that we, that we know about. So now that we have basically set the ground for everything we want to talk about, automated inference right so we want to infer false fields from scratch uh, based on some data that we see or that we know um, <clears throat> so we start on the uh, in the top left corner where we say for instance for bonds okay so as i said in my universe there's just one bond type um, which is encoded with this marks meaning star so star till the star means any atom with any bond bonded to any other atom. <clears throat> um, and now we're going to split that into two bond types. So we're looking for a partition, so for, a, for two smart patterns that sort of split our initial parent smart pattern in, in a sort of optimal way. Um, and this is, this is the same as asking, uh, please explore all possible ways to partition a set with n elements. And this is encoded by some, this is this also described as something called bell numbers, um, which is part of a like well-known math mathematical combinatorial problem. And <clears throat> this basically uh, tells us that the number of ways we can split types is really huge. If you think about something like LNN dipeptide, <clears throat> which has um, 14 bonds, we, we can basically say with, you know, the molecule of LNN dipeptide has 14 bonds. We can essentially have um, uh, 100 million different force fields that have two bond types. So the, the combinatorial space that is spanned by, um, that, that, is, that, that is accessible for us is really huge. So we must come up with a smart way to explore, to explore this, this space. And um, the first thing we need to do, is I'm, I would just want to talk very briefly about that, is we want to find a way to, to encode smart patterns um, in some sort of in some sort of vector that we can that we can use in the context of an algorithm, and this is done by this uh, by something that I'm call, that I'm calling a mapping vector, um, 
And this basically says, okay, so a mapping vector of a given length and this length encodes the maximum amount of information I encode, can encode in a smart string. And, and each element in that mapping vector basically says, um, um, uh, or informs about the, the, the things and the chemistry I can put into a smart vector, right? So this is, this is really just, really just a way to, to encode, to encode chemistry in a smart, in a smart string into some sort of class vector. The next thing is, and that's really important, is um, how do we make the decision, the decision um, what, what splits, what type splits we want to actually include for, you know, for a full parameter optimization. And of course, we want, do not want to look at all 100 million possibilities we can split um, a type, right? We, we, could, we could not look at all those individual and minimize them. We would want to have some some sort of some sort of quick way to 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 score a given split in order to know whether or not this is worth minimize this is this is worth optimizing. And we use gradient scores for that. <clears throat> On what that basically means is for a given candidate split that we think is worth splitting. We say, okay, so what, is, what, are, what are the gradients um, on all the atoms that match the left, that match the left type um, and or what are all the, the gradients of the, for example, bonds that match the right type? And we look at those gradients and look at, um, um, basically, we want to know in what direction are they, are they pointing? And if they are pointing into opposite directions, we say that, okay, if we now throw this into a Newtonian optimizer that looks at the, at the gradient, um, it will you know, pull the parameters for these two types apart, which means that they end up in different areas of parameter space, um, which would be very beneficial um, for, for our optimization problem. Um, <clears throat> so we're basically computing the dot product of the left field and the right field. Um, and define and say that this is called the gradient score. And when this gradient score is you know, close to one, meaning that the gradients are pointing to opposite direction, we say, okay, this is a split we want to use further and uh, we want to fully optimize that. So now that we basically know how to, um, how to split things, we need to put this into a large context, right? So we are starting out by saying, um, okay, so, so we start by saying, okay, we need the first thing is to have like an objective function. The objective function is the log likelihood. So that tells me how accurate is my model. And then I'm including a penalty term that says how complex is my model. So I want to tune the complexity of the model represented by a number of parameters um, against the accuracy of my model. <clears throat> and there's basically there's one knob in there um, called but I'm calling K, this is a fixed it's a penalty factor that I can use to, to tune the complexity of the model against, against the factors. And now let's say let's say we start we start out with um a laser probe. We start with a set of M molecules. Um, and then in the first step, we're computing, we're computing the objective function. Um, of all my molecules, then we generate a set of random n mini batches containing n molecules. So we want to partition our whole our whole universe that we know into smaller universes, <clears throat> and then we try to find the k best splits in each of these individual universes um, using the gradient scores I talked about uh, the slide before. And then in the next step, um, we want to find the, the false parameters, but you know, the optimized false parameters in the best splits, <clears throat> so that we, we, we find a bunch of a bunch of candidate false fields in each of, of these individual universes, and then and then we ask the question: How well does each of this of these individual universes generalize to my whole universe? Right. So then we, we take the best false field that we find. That we find and we apply it to my whole data set. And in that way, we intrinsically tune our force field to, to generalize in some sense, because we, as I said, we, we, want, we want to expand, we want to take a small universe and apply it to the big universe. And then we do that over and over again until we convert to something. <clears throat> and by that, iteratively increasing our parameter space. 
So the, the first test that uh, I'm looking at is called the C4 test set. Um, and C4 just means take the GDP, take the GDP, for, uh, the, the GDP database and look at all molecules in there that have exactly four carbon atoms and whatever number of hydrogen atoms. <clears throat> um, um, our target data are optical geometries, optical equilibrium energies, saturation frequencies, and also total price. And um, the one important point is that we are not taking uh, a QM level energy surface, but the MM level energy surface. So that sort of ensures that, um, that the exact model is part of our solution space that is, ex that is actually accessible to our algorithm. <clears throat> Very briefly, uh, as I said before, we have a penalty factor K that balances model accuracy against model complexity. Um, and we see that you know, if, if this penalty factor K is, is not too high, so if, if it's 0.2 or, or, or 1, and 1 would mean we have actually the accurate information coherent here, um, and we see that it's, it's, our outcome is not very sensitive to how we choose K. If K is, is a bit larger, actually, than, than um, the number of then only then the number of uh, types goes down. <clears throat> okay, so how does how how does the algorithm work in practice? Um, on the top here, the black line indicates the value of the objective function. Red dots are the number of causal types we are discovering uh, throughout each iteration. Um, the number of angle types in uh, in green and the number of bond types in yellow. And these are the smart, these are the smart patterns we are finding. And on the right, you can see you can see the actual target data as it's evolving, right? So here, the green lines are causing causal price, blue lines are um, acting uh, vibrational frequencies, and the, uh, the, the dots and the red dots are um, of equilibrium energies. <clears throat> and one of the nice things is that you see that it's, so 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 twenty iterations they take about one day, um, and we are pretty. We are actually pretty much done after high iterations. Um, meaning that we can we can get a decent force field um, in less than half of the day. Um, <clears throat> if you have a closer look at the at the, uh, the, the, the smart patterns here, you see that they sort of make sense if you think about it. So um, this is this is a type, this, is, this is already ordered in a, in a hierarchy. And we find here that um, you know so so it seems to find the algorithm seems to find that there are single bonds that need to be need to be distinguished from everything else. There are ring bonds here, um, and well, in our case, we just have three and four membered rings, so um, chemistry is a bit of limited. Um, <clears throat> and then we find also a bit of a uh, bunch of other things. Um, but if you look at this bond type here, for example, it, it seems it seems to manage to distinguish um, three membered rings from four membered rings, um, which which is encoded is encoded here. Um, however, these so this the C four set has intrinsic limitations with respect to chemistry. Um, you can see that here. If we want to now expand that on a test set, um, which is the C five set, so same idea. We take uh, all the molecules with exactly five carbon atoms, um, and we see, okay, so um, you know a lot of these torsion profiles are actually spot on, but there are, there are a lot of torsion profiles. For example, the guy over here is completely off. So the RMSE um, for torsional energies is uh, is, rough, is roughly five kilojoules per mole. <clears throat> okay, so let me briefly talk about sampling of parameter space. Um, very quickly, um, now I'm doing, I'm representing um, chemistry a bit differently than before. Now we're not using smart vectors or smart mapping vectors or whatever. We are basically now looking into Bell space directly. So the space, the, the, the full space that is, that is um, accessible to, to type assignments <clears throat> by just saying, okay, so there's something called a Z vector and a Z vector just encodes um, all the, in case of bonds, all the individual unique, chemically unique bonds in my molecule or set of molecules. Um, <clears throat> and for each of these bonds, in case of butane, it's four, four bonds, um, I can assign different bond types to these, uh, to these elements in the Z vector. And 
this allows me essentially to to encode all of different combinations of type assignments in a given in a given molecule. <clears throat> so we can take that and put it into a posterior probability and say, okay, so my posterior probability is just uh, z. So my my typing vector representation and my parameter value representation and this conditions on some data and then I'm calling y. <clears throat> um, and then um, you must come up with this with a smart with, with a way to to sample this whole thing. And the idea here is that to separate out the sampling of the uh, of the type space and the and the parameter value space by um, by just saying okay, so you can, we can do Gibbs sampling in the space of types, and we can do reversal of jump Monte Carlo and lang and Langevin adjusted sampling. Um, in, the, in the space of parameter values. And I don't want to go into detail a lot about that, um, but I have some slides on it and on that and summary is interested. I'm really delighted to talk about it. Um, it gave me a lot of headache to come up with these things. Um, and this is how, how look, no, okay, let's leave your play. So this, yeah, so this is now sort of a, a movie of the of the progression of this um, of, of the sampling algorithm. Um, and we see that for example here the angle the number of angle types, you see that we when, when we start from scratch, we are you know slowly exploring the number of uh, the, the angle angle type space. So um, we are converging to in this case to uh, sorry, two angle types. Um, and also two bond types for for that small test system we are looking at, um, and uh, that's that pretty much makes sense because that just include, uh, included butane and cyclic butane, um, and there are some some other nice things we can we can do in the context in the context of of, uh, of sampling the posterior, which is we can play around we can play around with our error model, and um, what that means is um, as you know in a in a likelihood. We are we are assuming that we are assuming that there's there's some some error contained in our uh, in our model and in experimental data we can play with that a bit and if we if we assume large deviations or if if we if we assume sorry if we assume a large error model uh, assuming that our reference data has a large error then we actually get I don't know if you can see that but then when we find false models that have uh, just one angle type and well two tall or two, two bond types, um, but one angle type, and it means if your if your reference data just has a large error, there's no reason that you should have a more complex model. However, if you are assuming that that your reference data has a small error, meaning that you you are assuming that okay, I have pretty I have pretty good knowledge about or I have a pretty good guess. That that my reference data is pretty pretty precise. Then you will you will find that your um, that that your sampling um, models that have you know, two angle types, um, <clears throat> which proves that you can use that this concept actually to to tune force to intrinsically tune force field complexity um, against uh, against the precision of your against the accuracy of your reference data. To summarize this. Um, you can infer force fields from scratch uh, using a deterministic approach that is based on gradient scores, and we can also use uh, sampling and parameter space and parameter type space. And for the for the near future, um, I'm looking into including more data, getting a better idea of um, uh, of, of of using test sets. And in the distant future, uh, I want to apply these things to non-modern interactions, different functional forms, um, and especially class two force fields. I want to thank a lot of people. So basically, the for the Gilson Lab, where I've done the first part of my postdoc, many people from the Open Force Field Consortium um, um, that are also involved in other in the, in the crystal structure project I'm working on, and also people from my current lab in, in Frankfurt, and also the DFG for funding. Thank you. <laughs>